let's take a look at the process of employee onboarding. Orientation provides new employees with the basic information they need to do their jobs. The manager wants to accomplish four things when orienting new employees. Making the new employee feel welcome and at home is being part of the team is critically important. Make sure that the new employee has basic information to function effectively, such as email access, personnel policies and benefits, and work behavior expectations. Help the new employee understand the organization in a broad sense, its past, present, culture, and strategies and visions for the future. Start socializing the person into the firm's culture and the ways of doing things. Onboarding ideally begins before the person's first day. On the first day, make sure colleagues know the new employee is starting and arrange for one or more of them to take the person to lunch. On subsequent days, the new employee should meet colleagues in their departments. After about two weeks, speak with the employee to identify any concerns. The length of the onboarding program depends on what you cover. Human Resources often performs the first part of orientation by explaining basic matters like working hours and benefits. Then the supervisor continues by explaining the department's organization, introducing the person to their new colleagues, familiarizing themselves with the workplace, and reducing first aid jitters. At a minimum, the orientation should provide information on employee benefits, personnel policies, safety measures and regulations, and a facilities tour. And it's important to make sure new employees feel welcome and proud. Supervisors should be vigilant follow up and encourage new employees to engage in activities such as taking breaks with colleagues that will enable them to learn the ropes. Employers should assume that their employee handbook content is a legally binding commitment. Even apparently sensible handbook policies can backfire without proper disclaimer. The handbook should include a disclaimer stating that nothing in the handbook should be taken as creating a binding contract between the employer and employees and all employment is at will. Employers use technology to support this type of orientation. The employer's strategic plan should guide its long range training goals. In essence, the task is to identify the employee behavior that the organization will need in order to execute its strategy and then deduce what skills and knowledge employees will need. Then put into place training goals and programs to instill these competencies. The employer should use a rational training process like the ADDIE model. Let's take a look. The gold standard here is still the basic analysis, develop, design, implement, and evaluate or ADDIE training process model that training experts have used for years. In this model, we analyze the training need, design the overall training program, develop the course by creating materials, implement the training, and evaluate the course's effectiveness. Using ADDIE provides structure and promotes results in training. The training needs analysis may address long-term training needs or current training needs. Strategic goals, perhaps to enter new lines of business or expand abroad, often mean the firm will have to fill new jobs. Strategic training needs analysis identifies the training employees will need to fill these future jobs. Most training efforts aim to improve current performance, specifically training new employees and those whose performance is deficient. How you analyze current training needs depends on whether you're training new or current employees. The main task for new employees is to determine what the job entails and to break it down into subtasks. Analyzing current employees' training needs is more complex because you also have to ascertain whether training is the solution. For example, performance may be due to poor motivation. Particularly with lower skill level workers, it's customary to hire inexperienced personnel and to train them. The aim here is to give these new employees the skills and knowledge they need to do the current job. Task analysis is a detailed study of the job to determine what specific skills like reading spreadsheets the job requires. Job descriptions list the job's specific duties and skills which help the training required. For underperforming current employees, you can't assume that training is the solution. In other words, it might be a lack of training or something else. 
Performance analysis is the process of verifying that there is a performance deficiency and determining whether the employer should correct such deficiencies through training or some other means. Uncovering why performance is down is at the heart of performance analysis. The aim here is to distinguish between can't do and won't do problems. Employers often focus on building work-related competencies or skills. The competency model consolidates, usually in one diagram, a precise overview of the competencies someone would need to do the job well. Competency-oriented training is similar to other training in the workplace. Armed with a needs analysis results, the manager next designs the training program itself. Design includes objectives, delivery methods, and program evaluation. Substeps include setting performance objectives, creating a detailed training outline, choosing a program delivery method, and verifying the overall program design with management. The design should include summaries of how you plan to set a training environment that motivates your trainees to both learn and to transfer what they learn to the job. At the outset, the trainer should clearly define the program's desired learning outcomes. It's the trainer's job to formulate training needs into tangible program outcomes. Training, development, learning, or instructional objectives should specify in measurable terms what the trainee should be able to do after successfully completing the program. Learners are more motivated to learn something that has meaning for them. Instructors should make it easy for transfer of new skills and behaviors from the training site to the job site and make sure the learner gets plenty of feedback. Less than 35% of trainees seem to be transferring what they've learned to their jobs a year after training. Improving on that requires steps at each training stage. During training, provide trainees with training experiences and conditions, surroundings, and equipment that resemble the actual work environment. After training, reinforce what trainees have learned. Reward those employees for using their new skills. Program development means assembling the program's training content and materials. It means choosing the specific content the program will present, as well as designing and choosing the specific instructional methods like lectures, cases, web-based, and so on that you'll use. Training equipment and materials include iPads, workbooks, lectures, PowerPoint slides, web and computer-based activities, course activities, and trainer resources and manuals. Some employers create their own training content, but there's also a vast selection of online and offline content. The Association for Talent Development illustrates the many off-the-shelf training and development offerings available. It includes certificate programs on topics like coaching, consulting, skills, and presentations. We'll see that much of training today takes place online or uses other digital tools such as iPhones or iPads. However, much training is still in-person and interpersonal, as on-the-job training notably illustrates. On-the-job training, known as OTJ, means having a person learn on a job by actually doing it. The most familiar on-the-job training is the coaching method. Here, an experienced worker or trainee supervisor trains the employee. This may involve observing or having the trainer show the new employee the ropes step-by-step. Job rotation, in which an employee moves from job to job at planned intervals, is another OTJ technique. Special assignments similarly give lower-level executives first-hand experience in working on actual problems. Plan and structure the OTJ experience. Train the trainers themselves and provide training materials. Because low expectations may translate into poor trainee performance, supervisors and trainers should emphasize their high expectations. Effective coaching is essential. In one study of pharmaceutical sales representatives, supervisors' coaching skills were associated with significant differences in goal attainment between sales districts. Many firms use peer training for OTJ. For example, some adopt peer-to-peer -peer development. The employer selects several employees who spend several days per week over several months learning what the technology or change will entail and then spread the new skills and values to their colleagues back on the job. Others use employee teams to analyze jobs and prepare training materials. Apprenticeship training is a process by which people become skilled workers. 
Many apprenticeships pay well. For example, at the Tennessee Valley Authority, starting apprentices earn about $40,000 a year and can earn up to $65,000 before moving on to $75,000 jobs as linemen. The U.S. Department of Labor promotes apprenticeship programs. More than 460,000 apprentices participate in 28,000 programs, and registered programs can receive federal and state contracts and other assistance. The Trump administration recently proposed a boost to its apprenticeship program. Training experts use the notation 70-20-10 to show how people actually learn. 70% of job learning occurs informally on or off the job. 20% reflects social interactions, like among employees on the job, and only 10% is actual formal learning. A sampling of what would constitute informal training would include participating in meetings, coaching other people, attending conferences, working with customers, job rotation, and reading books and journals. Employers facilitate informal learning. For example, one Simmons plant places tools on cafeteria areas to take advantage of work-related discussions taking place. Installing whiteboards and markers can facilitate learning. Through their interactions, employees learn new ideas and build stronger relationships. Many jobs consist of a sequence of steps best learned step-by-step. Step. Such step-by-step -step training is called Job Instruction Training, or JIT. First, list the job's required steps, each in its proper sequence. Then list a corresponding key point, if any, beside each step. The steps in such a job instruction training sheet show trainees what to do. Lecturing is a quick and simple way to present knowledge to large groups of trainees. Here are some guidelines for presenting a lecture. Speak only about what you know well. Remember that clarity is king. Make sure your audience is clear about what you're saying. Give your listeners signals. Be alert to your audience. Watch body language for negative signals like fidgeting or boredom. Talk from notes or PowerPoint slides rather than reading from a script. Program learning is a step-by-step self-learning method that consists of three parts. In programmed learning, there are three parts where we present questions, facts, or problems to the learner, we allow the person to respond, and we provide feedback on the accuracy of answers with instructions on what to do next. Generally, programmed learning presents facts and follow-up questions frame by frame. What the next question is often depends on whether the learner or how the learner answers the previous question. Programmed learning reduces training time it also facilitates learning by letting trainees learn at their own pace, get immediate feedback, and reduce their risk of error. Some argue that trainees do not learn much more from programmed learning than from a textbook, yet studies generally support programmed learning's effectiveness. Computerized intelligent tutoring systems adjust to the trainee's unique needs. Behavior modeling involves showing trainees the right way of doing something. Behavior modeling is one of the most widely used, well-researched, and highly regarded psychologically-based training interventions. The basic procedure is follows. First, trainees watch live or video examples showing models behaving effectively in a problem situation. Next, the trainee gets to role play in a simulated situation. Here, they're to practice the effective behaviors demonstrated by the model. The trainer provides reinforcement in the form of praise and constructive feedback. Finally, trainees are encouraged to apply their new skills when they're back on the job. Audiovisual-based training techniques are still used today. The Ford Motor Company uses videos in its dealer training sessions to simulate problems and reactions to various customer complaints. These trainings are increasingly replaced by web-based methods that accomplish much the same thing. With vestibule training, trainees learn on the actual equipment but are trained off the job. Vestibule training is necessary when it's too costly or dangerous to train employees on the job. Putting new assembly line workers right into work could slow production, as an example. 
Electronic Performance Support Systems, or an EPSS, are computerized tools that automate training. When you call a Dell service rep, they're probably asking questions prompted by an EPSS. It takes you both step-by-step step through an analytical sequence. Without an EPSS, Dell would have to train its service reps to memorize an unrealistically large number of solutions. Performance support systems are modern job aids. Job aids are a set of instructions, diagrams, or similar methods available at the job site to guide the worker. Job aids work particularly well on complex jobs that require multiple steps. Video conferencing involves delivering programs over the internet or satellite. Vendors such as Cisco offer video conference products such as WebEx or Telepresence. Video conferencing allows users in different locations to hold face-to-face -face meetings without having to be in a single location together. As remote work becomes increasingly common, video conferencing becomes more widely used. Computer-based training uses interactive systems to increase knowledge or skills. Computer-based training is increasingly realistic. Simulated learning means different things to different people. It might refer to virtual reality type games, a step-by-step -step animated guide, or online role plays with photos and videos. Virtual reality puts the trainee in an artificial, three-dimensional environment that simulates events and situations experienced on the job. Training games needn't be complicated. Most employers are moving to online-based learning because of the efficiencies involved. Employers use online learning to deliver almost all types of training in the employment environment. Learning management systems known as LMS are special software tools that support online training by helping employers identify training needs and to schedule, deliver, assess, and manage the online training itself. The typical LMS features include a course library, quizzes, reports, and dashboards for monitoring training performance, messaging and notification systems, and a facility for scheduling and delivering both virtual and classroom training. The need to teach large numbers of students remotely or to enable trainees to study at their leisure often makes e-learning attractive. Online learning doesn't necessarily teach individuals faster or better. Lifelong learning means providing employees with continuing learning experiences. Lifelong learning may thus range from basic skills to college degrees. Diversity training aims to improve cross-cultural sensitivity as to foster more harmonious working relationships among employees. It typically includes improving interpersonal skills and valuing cultural differences. Teamwork doesn't always come naturally. In terms of technical training, for instance, management encourages team employees to learn each other's jobs to encourage flexible team assignments. Cross-training means training employees to do different tasks or jobs than their own. Doing so facilitates job rotation, as when you expect team members to occasionally share jobs or parts of a job. Interpersonal problems often undermine teamwork. Team training, therefore, typically includes interpersonal skills training, such as listening, communicating, handling conflict, and negotiating. Effective teams also require team management skills, for instance, in problem solving, meetings management, consensus-driven decision-making, and team leadership. Many employers use team training to build more cohesive management teams. Some use outdoor adventure training for this, perhaps to learn survival skills and thereby foster trust and cooperation. The small business owner can tap thousands of suppliers of prepackaged training solutions. Those range from self-study programs from the American Management Association and SHRM to specialized or customized programs. The government's Small Business Administration provides a virtual campus that offers online courses to employers. Management development programs should reflect an organization's strategic plans. For example, strategies to enter new businesses or expand overseas imply that the employer will need succession plans to obtain or develop managers who have the skills to manage these new businesses. Management development programs then impart the knowledge attitudes and skills these managers will need to excel at their job. Some management development programs are company-wide and involve all or most new or potential managers. Management development supports the employer's succession planning process. 
Succession planning involves developing workforce plans for the company's top positions. Some high potential managers fail in their jobs, while some low potential managers excel. How then does the employer choose who to send through an expensive development program? The nine box grid is one tool. It shows potential from low to medium to high on a vertical axis and performance from low to medium to high across the bottom, a total of nine possible boxes. The grid can simplify somewhat the task of choosing development candidates. At the extremes, for instance, low potentials and low performers would not move on. The high potential, high performer stars likely would. Most employers focus their development resources on high performance, high potential stars, and secondarily on those rated high potential, moderate performance, or high performance and moderate potential. Other employers focus development resources on the company's mission critical employees, those central to the firm's success and survival. In any case, individual assessment should always precede development. This assessment becomes the basis for each manager's individual development plan. Action learning projects then supplement individual and group training activities. Managerial on-the-job training methods include job rotation, coaching, and action learning. Job rotation means moving managers from department to department to broaden their understanding of the business and to test their abilities. In addition to providing a well-rounded experience, job rotation helps avoid stagnation through the consistent introduction of new points of view in each department. It also helps identify each trainee's strong and weak points. Periodic job changing also can improve interdepartmental cooperation. Managers become more understanding of each other's problems and rotation widens one's acquaintances among management. Action learning programs give managers released time to work on analyzing or solving problems in departments other than their own. Stretch assignments are assignments that push employees beyond their comfort zone placing them in jobs and assignments different from and more demanding than those which they're accustomed. These assignments should be challenging, but not overwhelming. The case study method has trainees solve realistic problems after studying cases. The person then analyzes the case, diagnoses the problem, and presents their finding and solutions in a discussion with other trainees. Integrated case scenarios create long-term, comprehensive case situations. Computerized management games enable trainees to learn by making decisions. Gamification of training in general also reportedly improves learning, engagement, and morale, and is fairly easy to achieve. For instance, use point systems, badges, and leaderboards in training. Numerous companies and universities offer web-based and traditional classroom management development, leadership, supervision, and similar seminars and conferences. In role-playing, trainers create a realistic situation and then have trainees assume the parts. When combined with the general instructions and other roles, role-playing can trigger spirited discussions among trainees. The aim is to develop trainees' skills in areas like leadership and delegation. Many firms establish in-house development centers, often called corporate universities. Increasingly, employers offer virtual, rather than brick and mortar, corporate university services. Many firms retain executive coaches to help develop their top manager's effectiveness. An executive coach is an outside consultant who counsels the executive based upon an understanding of their strengths and weaknesses. The coaching field is an unregulated environment, so managers should do their due diligence in making selections and identifying the best executive coaches. What are the characteristics of effective leadership training programs? One major study's findings suggest a number of things. The best programs begin with a thorough needs analysis to determine tangible program goals. Mandatory participation in the program is as effective as voluntary participation. Self-administered programs are less effective than trainer-based programs and practice-based programs are more effective than information-based programs. Providing feedback to trainees boosts the program effectiveness. On-site programs at company facilities are generally more effective than off-site training programs. Face-to-face -face leadership training programs are more effective than virtually-based programs. 
and leadership training is as effective for senior level leaders as for lower level leaders. Psychologist Kurt Lewin formulated a model for implementing change. To Lewin, all behavior in organizations was a product of two kinds of forces, those striving to maintain the status quo and those pushing for change. Implementing change means reducing the forces for the status quo or building up the forces for change. Unfreezing means reducing the forces that are striving to maintain the status quo, usually by presenting a productive problem or event to get people to recognize the need for change and to search for new solutions. Moving means developing new behaviors, values, and attitudes. The manager may accomplish this through organizational structure change or through training and development activity. Refreezing means building in the reinforcement to making sure the organization doesn't slide back into its former ways of doing things. Lewin emphasizes that change flows from one process to the next. Organizational development is a change process. It usually involves action research, which means collecting data about a group, department, or organization and feeding the information back to employees so they can analyze it and develop a hypothesis about what problems might be. It applies behavioral science knowledge to improve the organization's effectiveness. It changes the organization in a particular direction towards empowerment, improved problem solving, responsiveness, quality of work, and effectiveness. Survey research is another of many OD options. How can we be sure that training caused the results that we're seeing? The time series design is one option. Here, you take a series of performance measures before and after the training program. This can provide some insight into the program's effectiveness. However, you can't be absolutely sure that the training program, rather than say a raise, caused the change. Controlled experimentation is therefore the gold standard. A controlled experiment uses a training group and a control group that receives no training. Data, for instance, on the quantity of sales or quality of service are obtained both before and after one group is exposed to training and before and after a corresponding period in the control group. This makes it easier to determine if any change in performance resulted from the training.